Hello, and welcome to the Counter Narrative Project's celebration of the life and legacy of Essex Hemphill. My name is Johnny Ray Cornegay III, and I am the Mobilization Director for the Counter Narrative Project. Please subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and make sure that you hit the like button on this video. Please be sure to leave your comments below and make sure that you share this video. Please follow us on social media. On Twitter, we can be found at Building Desire, and on Facebook and Instagram, we can be found at The Counter Narrative. Essex Hemphill was born on April 16, 1957. According to the Poetry Foundation, Hemphill was a poet and performer known for his political edge. Essex Hemphill openly addressed race, identity, sexuality, HIV, AIDS, and family in his work, voicing issues central to the African-American gay community. It is our honor always to celebrate his legacy. Joining me tonight are three amazing artists in their own right. They are here to share some of his words. Hello, everyone. I'm Corey Bradley here in St. Louis, Missouri, and I am a part of the Counter Narrative Tribe. I will be reading for you Heavy Corners inscribed for Joe. Don't let it be loneliness that kills us. If we must die on the front line, let us die men loved by both sexes. But don't let it be envy that, that drives us to suck our thumbs or shoot each other dead over snake eyes. Let us not be dancing with the wind on heavy corners tattered by doom. Let us not accept partial justice. If we believe our lives are priceless, we can't be conquered. If we must die on the front line, don't let loneliness kill us. This piece is titled, For My Own Protection. I wanna start an organization to save my life. If whales, snails, dogs, cats, Chrysler, and Nixon can be saved. The lives of black men are priceless and can be saved. We should be able to save each other. I, I don't wanna wait for the Heritage Foundation to release a study stating black men are almost extinct. I don't want to be the living dead pacified with drugs and sex. If, if a human chain can be formed around missile sites, then surely black men can form human chains around Anacostia, Harlem, South Africa, Wall Street, Hollywood, each other. If we have to take tomorrow with our blood, are we ready? Do our S curls, dreadlocks, and fillies make us any more ready than a bush or a conca line? I'm not concerned about the attire of a soldier. All I want to know for my own protection is are we capable of whatever, whenever? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Smith, and I am here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a proud member of the Counter Narrative Project Tribe. I'm going to read two selections. The first piece that I'll read is In the Life. Mother, do you know I roam alone at night? I wear colognes, tight pants, and chains of gold as I search for men willing to come back to candlelight. I'm not scared of these men, though some are killers of sons like me. I learned there is no tender mercy 
for men of color, for sons who love men like me. Do not feel shame for how I live. I chose this tribe of warriors and outlaws. Do not feel you failed some test of motherhood. My life has borne fruit. No woman could have given me anyway. One of these thick-lipped, wet, black nights, while I'm out walking, I find freedom in this village. If I can take it with my tribe, I'll bring you here. And you will never notice the absence of rice and bridesmaids. American Wedding. In America, I place my ring on your cock where it belongs. No horsemen bearing terror, no soldiers of doom will swoop in and sweep us apart. They're too busy looting the land to watch us. They don't know we need each other critically. They expect us to call in sick, watch television all night, die by our own hands. They don't know we are becoming powerful. Every time we kiss, we confirm the new world coming. What the rose whispers before blooming, I vow to you. I give you my heart, a safe house. I give you promises other than milk, honey, liberty. I assume you will always be a free man with the dream. In America, place your ring on my cock where it belongs. Long may we live to free this dream. Hello, everybody. My name is Monty J. Wolf. I am here from Washington, D.C. with Brave Soul Collective. I am a proud member of the Counter Narrative Project, and tonight I will be reading two pieces written by Essex Hemphill. The first piece entitled, Oh, Tell Me, Brutus. Oh, tell me, Brutus, with corpses decomposing in the river, loved ones keeping fevers, quiet in city hospitals, the back rooms locked and chained, the police with new power to seize and search our hearts, our kisses, our mutual consents around midnight. Oh, tell me, Brutus, what are we to do with all this leather, all these whips and chains? And the second piece that I will read is entitled, Now We Think. Now we think as we fuck. This nut might kill us. There might be a pen-sized hole in the condom, a lethal leak. We stop kissing tall, dark strangers, sucking must. It's putting lips, tongues everywhere. We return to pictures, telephones, toys, recent lovers, private lives. Now we think as we fuck. This nut might kill. This kiss could turn to stone. Thank you all so much for being here and sharing this beautiful work that, you know, we firmly believe that we have to continue to celebrate and to honor. We just do, right? Um, so I want to start this very, very simply. Like, how did you, and Corey, I'm going to start with you for this, and I'm just kind of going to go around. How did you find... Essex. What was your journey to finding Essex? You know, I um, no, you don't know. Well, yeah, you might. <laughs> I, I came out later in my life, so I'm like 41 now, and uh, came out 
if that's the best way to describe that, about 35. So I I'm, I still feel like a bit of a like gay teenager in ways. So I'm just discovering a lot of things and Essex work and his passion and his fire is one of those things. And I primarily was connected to the work and um, his influence through counter narrative, actually, and through Charles and uh, paying attention to the different events and um, started really figuring out like, yo, this brother has a whole lot to say that's important. Um, so my journey really to him is is a little brief, but my journey into him as far as the exploration of his work is probably what's more powerful for me. And those things that I think about are just the rawness. And he makes nasty so beautiful. I've just never heard somebody just use sensuality in such a way that is just philosophical uh, to the height. Um, he actually looks like somebody that might think a big boy like me is attractive. So I like that. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, there's just all these different ways. I think that his honesty um, and his uh, transparency has been the thing that has helped me discover not only, you know, him and his thoughts, but also to discover myself in the process. Thank you, Corey. Monty, how did you find Essex? What was your journey? Um, you know, I, that's the one I really had to think about. And, um, I've shared this with you all a lot in the past. I came to Washington, DC in 1995. So it was about 20, 25 years ago. Um, and when I first moved here, I did not know anything about black, gay, anything. And that first like six to eight months when I was in Washington, DC at Howard, um, I was reading everything that I could get my hands on that was black and gay. I mean, that's where I discovered Elon Harris and James Earl Hardy. And, you know, I, I had heard, of course, I'd heard of James Baldwin all my life, but I was not familiar with his work. And I went back and I read James Baldwin and somehow I stumbled upon um, In the Life and, you know, learned about Joseph Beam and Marlon Riggs and Essex. And, you know, it's one of those kind of things where I read some of the things and I just kind of, it was so much information that I just kind of moved past it. Um, but it always just kind of stayed with me. And then what happened was probably years later, somewhere between, I'd say, 2000, year 2000 and 2004 or five, um, I had met all these people in my circle here in Washington, D.C., like my mentor, Alan Sharp, um, another mentor, friend, Michael St. Andrews, and all these other black gay men, Ron Simmons, with us helping us, who I knew, who knew Essex. A lot of them knew Essex. And when I started finding my sea legs as an artist, as a a writer, as an actor, um, and really started to speak very clearly about my experience as a black gay man and what it was like to be sexual, to have sadness, to have fear, to have this fearlessness and all of these things just mixed up all in one. I had Ron Simmons and other people say to me, like, you remind us of him because there's something that you have that's just very raw, very just unapologetic um, and very vulnerable and honest. And, you know, it was one of those kind of things where I went back when I got those words from people who were close to me. And that's when I really started digging into the work and it felt like it was a roadmap back to myself. And then I think the thing that just stung, I won't say it stung. It, it was like kind of figuring myself out when I went back and read about, you know, the fact that he was a D.C. native and that between D.C. and New York and Philly, you know, these black gay men had this brotherhood, this kinship. I learned that he died in 1995. And this is, mind you, sometime between like 2003 and 2004 or five. Um, I learned that he died in 1995, which was the year when I landed in D.C. and he died on my birthday. On November 4th, 1995, and I had been here probably about three months because I moved here in August. So when I read that, it felt like at that moment, it was just kind of like I didn't even know it. As a 20-year-old black gay man coming here and trying to figure things out, um, here was this other person whose journey was about to come to an end in, a, in the physical realm. And he was passing a baton to me that I didn't even know existed. And I didn't even know that he existed until years later. But his words are what just kept me connected to him through all these other people who knew him in life. Um, and it was just one of those kind of things where it just continued to just deepen in my love and my appreciation for his, again, for his candor. 
for his honesty, for his unwillingness to cover it up or try to make it pretty or try to put a Band-Aid on it, like to just rip the Band-Aid off and say, this is what it is. And also that he didn't just speak about black gay men. He was about liberation for everybody, for black women, for black people, um, just for anybody who identified as the other or somebody who felt marginalized. And that's something that I I live with, is feeling like the other. I've always felt like that. So that was what just really kind of brought me to him and why I have this kinship and why I carry him in my heart. Justin? So um, I came to Essex through a gift of In the Life and Brother to Brother when I was a freshman in college. One of my friends who was, uh, you know, kind of doing the baton passing that I feel like, you know, we as black gay men definitely need to do to, you know, younger folks coming up behind us. He did that. You know, he he I didn't even realize the significance of, of the gift of those books at the time. But it was the first time I had been able to read in just a very plain way the integration of, you know, my blackness and my gayness. And, you know, because I was, I believe that there was not a way for me to be able to integrate those identities as an 18 year old. Um, so it was really right on time that, you know, I came to college and like literally within like three weeks, someone had given me these books and um, it really saved my life. And I, I don't say that with any type of hyperbole. It's just that, you know, it was the first time I'd really seen myself reflected on the page and you know my life was given you know validity in a way by the work of Essex and and his contemporaries so um so I try to just be you know um I have so much reverence for these words because I know how much they did for me when I first encountered them so I wanted to make sure that you know all black gay men especially but everybody should know about Essex Hemphill and so um but I think, you know, the impact on his life, of his life and his words on me has been, um, you know, beyond measure. So I really, you know, feel like what's also powerful about his writing is that, you know, he wrote in a specific context, but he spoke universal truths that are still even potentially even more resonant in the moment that we're standing in right now. So. Um, I think that is the mark of genius when you can, um, you know, make the specificity of your situation and to tap into all these, you know, kind of more fundamental and more universal truths as you don't apologize for the truth that you're speaking. And he did that in such a powerful way. Thank you all so much for that. And Justin, I'm actually going to stay with you. Um, so I'm I'm actually going to tell my story for how I came to Essex Hemphill. And I actually, this story has been rewritten by the person who I thought introduced me to Essex. And they were like, no, 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 no. You did that to me. That wasn't me to you. You've constructed something incorrect. But what I do know for sure is it was that 1996 time frame like Monty, where we were kind of discovering, right? And um, the library, you know, I know that I don't remember when I don't, I, I thought it was given to me and I went to find it, but apparently I was going to find it and then I was giving it to others, right? But that 1996 time frame when I was, I knew I knew that I was gay. I didn't. And it was my goal to find stories and find people, specifically black gay men. And um, Essex was one of those people. I was a student at Temple University in undergrad, you know, searching for myself. And that is how I came to find Essex. And so, Justin, you mentioned something really interesting, right? We talk about this moment that we're in right now and today. Before we talk about this specific time, that we're taping this. I do want to talk about what, from your perspective, Justin, and we'll get feedback from everybody, what do you think that Black gay men need to know about Essex and his work? Well, I'll answer that in, in at least two ways. I think the first is it's just important for us as Black gay men to know that we have a cultural lineage and cultural history, and Essex is part of that. So we have you know, going back at least into the, in this country to, you know, 
moments of black cultural production that are explosive. So think about the Harlem Renaissance. Think about, you know, James Baldwin. And just think about all the great black minds who are black gay men that contributed so much to who we are, not just as black gay men, but just as black people. And I would insert Essex Hemphill into that that larger constellation of kind of contribution to black intellectual and cultural production. So I think, you know, he has a a truth that he speaks to our larger experience as black people in the United States. I think specifically though, for black gay men, he provides truth, you know, as in one of his works, the ass splitting truth, right? He never apologized about who he was. And I think that's just the energy that we need, you know, to just, to not apologize for who we are. And he provides, you know, a possibility model for what that can look like, not just on the page, but every time I've seen an interview with him and the footage that we have that has, you know, survived, that's what he presents. And so I think what a beautiful model for how to walk and stand in your truth that I think for many of us, you know, um, that can be an ongoing struggle. And to see someone that is confidently standing in that place provides a model for all of us to to strive for as Black Amen. Thank you, Justin. Corey, I want to open um, open it up to you. What do we need to know most about Essex and his work today? Thank you for that, um, for the opportunity to, to respond to that. So uh, some of what I hear that really resonates with me um, is this sense of affirmation that the work provided um, and, and Essex, Essex's voice. Um, as I mentioned, I came to be more visible with regard to my identity as a Black gay man later but as I read the work, I was like, oh, I've been thinking that. Oh, I've been saying that, right? Uh, that that was powerful for me. And that let me know that this was something extraordinary, something beyond my sexual attraction. That, that, that this gayness, if I can say, this Black gay identity, this Black gay connection, whatever the vibe, the energy, the melanin, I don't know but that it connects and unites us in a way that is far exceeding cultural aphorisms and the, 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 the sensuality. Not that those are to be, are diminished at all, but that there's something kind of just superb. Like I, I, there's this question that I want to ask to every black gay man, which is what does it mean to be black and gay? Like, what does that mean beyond just the club or beyond the affects, the accoutrements? And so, I, I think that Essex, Essex answers that for us, and a part of that answer is, and you you heard it in the pieces that I that I read, that we are priceless. Like that's, uh, you know, like that just can't be understated, uh, and particularly in a culture and an environment that seeks to make us believe that we are expendable, that we are the ruffians, that we are the misfits. That Essex comes along with seemingly, seemingly to the natural eye, coarse descriptions that are actually couched in how priceless and precious we are to the point that we ought to consider and count each other as priceless. And not necessarily fragile to the point of being uh, disrupted and, uh, and, and, and falling apart, but fragile in the sense of how we hold each other the esteem that we offer to one another um, and in the way that we show up for each other, interact with each other. And I just, I think that that is what I would hope that my black gay brothers would be able to embrace and hold that in as much as they are also accept that you are precious, priceless and treasured, then so are the others, right? Yeah, that's how I just wanted that. Precious, priceless and treasured. Thank you so much, Monty. Oh, um, Corey, thank you. And Justin, thank you. Because as I'm listening to you two speak, I'm just like, I, 
there's so much I, I I felt like I wanted to say, but you all, you know, you just kind of encapsulated a lot of it um, and what you just expressed. Um, but for me, what I feel like black gay men need to know most about Essex Penfield is that he existed, that he existed. Um, he came, he saw, he fucked shit up and he left his mark. And that was his intent. Um, I think like, Corey said, like Justin said, our lives are so priceless, but they're skewed and they're complicated and messy um, and tangled, just like everybody else's life is, lives. But for a lot of us, um, there's this undercurrent of sadness and loneliness and all of this stuff that sometimes we can't even locate or we can't understand. And for me, when I went and read this man's words, the anger the passion, the fear, the disappointment, um, all of those things just stood, they, 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 they just, they, they come out, they like, they leap off the page, but it also gives me permission. So for me, what I feel like Essex is about is they need to, we need to know that he exists, that he existed and he still exists through his words because he gave us permission to just be whoever we are. Um, beautifully human, as Jill, as, as uh, Jill Scott would say, and just you know to be broken, to be messy, to be all of those things, but to own that and to wear it like a badge of honor. Because for me, um, it was through Essex and through all of these other Black gay men, through my partnerships with the Counter Narrative and all the work that I've done with Brave Soul Collective and all of these things. That's how I learned that I have superpowers and all of that's connected to me being a black gay man because I don't shy away from any of that. And that's not to say that all of it is not complicated and sometimes I don't feel like giving up. But when I read his words, I'm just reminded that as alone as I still feel on any given day, that I'm never alone, and nor, nor have I ever been alone. So I think a lot of us need to know that he existed and that he continues to live on through his words because that's the stuff that's going to be the roadmap that's going to get us through so that when we feel like we're going to sink, we ain't gonna drown. Monty, I um perfect lead in. We cannot do anything right now without honoring the moments that we are in. This is an unprecedented time. We are taping this in the midst of this the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is in my opinion, it's really important. Essex's words are so important to us now, and I feel like we need them more than ever. And so I want to ask the question, and this is going to be my last question for everyone. Um, what, from your perspective, is the meaning of Essex Hemphill's words, Essex Hemphill's work, Essex Hemphill's life in our current moment? And Monty, I'll start with you. Thank you, Johnny. Um, you know, it's funny because the poems that I wound up reading tonight, one of them I'm profusely familiar with. Now we think I've, I've read that we performed it in January. You know, it's one of those ones that is one of his most popular works. But I got to be honest, Oh, Tell Me Brutus is one of those ones that I just kind of uh, glazed over. Um, I've read it before, but it didn't land for me the way that it landed tonight. And it was almost like I had to kind of fight back the emotion and the tears as I was reading it. Because like looking at it again, when it says with corpses decomposing in the river, like literally this is what's happening is that, you know, all with all of this death and destruction and all of these kinds of things that are happening and us having to see this and witness it. And sadly for some of us who have had to experience it with loved ones who have transitioned and who are, it, you know, like on the cusp, you know, of trying to just pull, push and pull through. Um, and, you know, just all of this stuff in this piece about the quiet in the city hospitals, the back rooms locked in chains, the police with new power to seize and search our hearts, our kisses, our mutual consents around midnight. I'm like, OK, this was written 30 over 30 years ago. But because of what we're going through right here, right now, in this moment in 2020, with all the technology, all the things that we allege that we're so great about or that, you know, the powers would that be would have you believe we're so great, you know, for. Um, and here we are, all of us having to at a full stop, having to sit still with ourselves 
and like figure this shit out because it's frightening, it's confusing, it's frustrating, and it's forcing us to kind of look at ourselves, re-examine, unpack everything. And I think that right here and right now, I mean, again, it's it's a roadmap to how to persevere, how to be resilient, how to sit in an uncomfortable spot and know that it's transient and it's passing through, even if it lasts six months, it's still transient. It's six months in the scope of your life. Because a lot of us right now, like we said before we started, we're having to hunker down and realize that, yeah, this ain't going to be over in a month, boo. That's not what this is. And it's frightening because the long-term impacts are frightening and it's going to uproot everybody. And all of this talk about going back to normal, I've seen a lot of people say, like, if we go back to normal, we're going to be right back where we started. So I think for now, it's really, it's, 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 a, it's a marker. And it's, it's, a, it's a way for us to kind of rewrite our history at this point. Because it's like, at this point, we had to shake the extra sketch clean. And we got to start over and start something new. So I think that his words and his work are both something that can, at least for me, it helps and it assists in ways that I didn't even realize until I read this. So for that, Charles, Johnny, again, thank y'all for just inviting us in to do this. Thank you. Corey? Absolutely. I, I want to borrow um, a couple of things I've heard. Um, one of them is to talk about, and I think it was mentioned how timely the wisdom is in uh, coming through the life of Essex Hemphill and the words and the work. And, uh, I, you know, um, he talks about in, in the, the, the poem, um, for my own protection, I believe it is, where he talks about not waiting for a report from the Heritage Foundation. And I was just reading an article that was talking about how when neoliberalism, this idea of the individual market, individual rugged, rugged, uh, ruggedness and, and kind of this, the, the, the kind of the destruction of the collective energy, when that was kind of dawning in the U.S., the Heritage Foundation was born. And I just thought like, oh my God, you could like say 2020, it's still very much the case. And so I'm gonna take some liberty and do as Cornell West has done because I don't think I've heard him say it, but that we need to deem and crown Essex Hemphill as a part of the prophetic tradition of black life and black reality, because absolutely this is um, an essence that we can live and eat from today. So that relevance uh, and the relevance of prophetic is that it becomes as a guidepost and a sign. So what's the meaning of it today? I think we take today's context and use those words to help interpret the signs of our times and how we are to respond and to be in this time. I think the other piece for me is much as Monty named even that we have permission to be provocative, to be bold, to be irreverent, um, to be accused of being, uh, you know, a mess and obnoxious, um, to be accused of being too smart and too erudite and too educated and to be accused of being too deep. We have the full bandwidth to be magical, right? That's I think that's what I'm actually saying. I think we lose in our reality um, the fantasy. And I think Essex brings that back to us um, and causes us to mirror that, to see ourselves as magical. Here's this line that, that, that confirms that for me. He says, if we must die on the front line, of course we must die, Essex. Of course we must die. But it's that, that imaginal, imagination that we are eternal, that we are perpetual. And I think that finally I'll say that is encapsulated in this collective power. That is what I think this current moment requires of us. Everybody's got an analysis. Where is the collective energy? Where are we joining together to, to create a forceful change? And, and so I, I think uh, we are not only looking to, to do this thing, to live this way, to answer these questions for our own protection, but that we, we should be able to save each other. Ooh, thank you, Corey, Justin, um, last word. So, 
So, wow. Um, I want to just echo the brilliant words that came before. What I would add is in these moments, it's important to think about who we turn to. And it's artists, it's poets, it is people that can help us not make sense of necessarily the the data. You know, in my day job, I do public health science. And so now everyone knows what that is. Uh, but that's not necessarily what, you know, artists do. They do the soul translation. Like, what does this actually mean for us as human beings on this planet? And Essex words do that type of translation. And so it's not surprising to me that we turn to poetry and to these things that help us make sense. Because, you know, me as an epidemiologist, or a public, I can't help you make sense of what this is. I can give you the numbers, I can give you the, the data, but like, what does it mean, you know? And that's where a poet like Essex Hemphill can help us try to make sense of something that doesn't really make any sense, right? And so I think that is the power of what his words offer to us. They offer us a pathway to make sense of a situation that is, in some ways, like there really isn't a, a guidepost for how we make sense of this. Because, you know, this, what do they call it? this? Is the novel coronavirus? Like it's never been seen before in human populations. So. In much, in much the same way that when Essex was writing, you know, HIV was sort of this new thing that people didn't know anything about. Uh, and so the fact that you wrote against that type of backdrop, I think it does give us um, at least a little bit of a, a wayfinder to get through this very, very difficult and challenging and scary moment. Um, so I, I think that's the power that he offers to us in this time. Thank you all so much. Um, Monty J. Wolf, Corey Bradley, and Justin Smith, thank you so much for joining us for this commemoration of the legacy of Essex Hemphill. Um, one of the things that you should make sure that you do if you're watching this video, make sure you subscribe right here on YouTube and make sure that you like this video. Please I'm follow sure. us. Yes, please share, please comment. We want to hear from you. Um, follow us on social media. On Twitter, we can be found at Building Desire. And on Facebook and Instagram, we can be found at The Counter Narrative. One thing I would like to say as we begin to close this evening is, one, continue to visit and find these words and make sure that you read them. They're available online. They're available in your local libraries. Please, please, please do what you can to find them. The other thing that I want to leave folks with is the reminder that you are magical, that you are magical, and that we can save each other. So thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.